Perfect. Hi, everyone. Hopefully, yeah, you can see and hear me okay um, as well. It's great to join everyone today. I think this is the, the third edition of the Rise Summit I've been um, involved in. Um, so very much looking forward to being a part of it again as well. Hopefully throughout, shouldn't be any tech issues. If there's any connection issues, hopefully be able to rejoin quite quickly um, as well. But yes, thank you for joining me today um, for the CSR Day. And hopefully you've been able to attend a number of kind of great sessions throughout the day. So I, what I want to cover is kind of elevating CSR through strategic impact initiatives and kind of what that actually means and the evolution of CSR and how it's going forward um, as well. So I suppose a bit of a background about me and probably explains some of my involvement in CSR. So I'm Philip. Uh, my day job is a strategy and management consultant at a company called Elixir based in London um, as well. And then I'm also the chief executive officer of a group called CSRN which is a pro bono uh, consultancy working with charities in regions of crisis as well. And CSRN has been a partner um, with Rise Infinity for a number of years now. I'm also the director of learning at a organization called Action for Refugee Life, which is based in the Kukuma camp in Kenya as well, and educating refugees with digital skills. Prior to Elixir, I was also in PwC as well, which is a large corporate organization that I'm sure many have heard of as well. And within that, I was involved in the CSR teams. So. I've had a lot of different perspectives on CSR through my corporate experience, through some of the projects I've been on with different clients, through my charity and nonprofit side. Um, so collaborating and creating those strategies and initiatives, but also then being on the on the charity side for receiving kind of donations and resources um, as well. And this has given me quite a broad perspective now on the topic of CSR. In terms of some of the topics we want to cover today, firstly looking at a bit of an evolution of CSR and how it's evolved over time, but obviously not giving too much of a history lesson. Um, how to you know develop an organization's CSR strategy and the approach, engaging your employees, engaging your communities, what innovation for social impact actually now looks like, applying CSR to your supply chain, and then the investment kind of space and the corporate investment space. So I'll jump right in uh, for time. There's a long and varied history associated with the evolution of the concept of corporate social responsibility, but don't worry, I'm not gonna make an extensive history lesson, just more of a brief recap. Although the concept of CSR has been around for a long time, it has changed dramatically since its inception. Most notably, the scope of CSR started extremely narrow, but has since widened to include many more issues and impact a wider range of business decisions. What started as a movement for businesses to give to charity and reduce working hours has blossomed into an initiative that has changed the way business is done and affects every aspect of a business's operations. This transformation began in the 1960s when scholars began to approach CSR as a response to the emerging problems of the new modern society and businesses in turn started implementing these practices. Yet as before CSR was viewed through a relatively narrow lens, with many scholars claiming that companies are not responsible for addressing large scale social problems. Instead, their responsibility extends only to the direct consequences of their decisions and business actions. So while the 1960s did mark progress in CSR, in the CSR movement, it in no way mirrored our current understanding of corporate responsibility. Business adoption of CSR continued steadily in the 1970s and 80s and became all more important in the 80s due to great deregulation of business meaning corporations had to engage in more self-regulation and take responsibility for the social impact of their operations. However, CSR during this time was mainly limited to human and labour rights, pollution and waste management, all very kind of standard areas. Increasing globalisation in the 1990s was instrumental in widening the access and the scope of CSR and laid the foundation for how we understand CSR today. A wide array of international events and agreements occurred in the 90s, namely the adoption of um, Agenda 21, which is a UN framework, um, and the Convention of Climate Change, and also the Kyoto Protocol as well, which many kind of still know to this day, and that kind of came before the Paris Agreement. These events increased CSR concerns for multinational corporations, and for the first time, made businesses consider their impact on the world as a whole, compared to just their local communities. Throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, the rhetoric of CSR began to shift from minimising local harm to tackling global issues. And then we now look at today. Businesses are missing out if they aren't participating in CSR. It has become an integral part of doing business 
and is increasingly driving consumer choice. For instance, nearly 90% of consumers would purchase a product because a company supported an issue they care about, while 75% would refuse to buy a product if the company had a different stance on an issue. And we've seen this become increasingly popular as there's a lot more polarization um, kind of going on in the world, especially around certain events um, as well. CSR is also a big factor in attracting talented employees as people want to work for a company that upholds strong values. Further, a comprehensive CSR program can have the benefits of increased brand reputation, credibility, improved risk and supply chain management, cost savings and efficiency gains as well, and also increased revenue. Companies are thus discovering that CSR is not only better for society, but in many cases, it's better for business as well. We then move on to kind of how, how do you go about developing your CSR strategy and what are the starting points and um, formulate it? Creating a strong CSR, uh, CSR strategy can make a big difference in how a business interacts with the world. A good CSR plan tackles important social and environmental issues, making sure that the business activities don't harm society, communities, employees, customers, and other important groups. First, it's all about how to make sure your CSR actions fit well with each other and make sense for your business. Stop any activities that don't help solve a social or environmental problem. I once saw a great presentation that summarized these activities into three theaters or kind of public performances because CSR tends to be very external and very kind of using a lot of marketing and things like that. So it was once described as theaters and theater one revolves around philanthropy where companies donate to social causes often without a direct link to their business activities. Theater two involves integrating CSR into a company's core operations where social benefits are derived as a direct result of business activities. And theater three entails transforming the business model itself to address social issues, possibly creating new markets and customer groups. These theaters aren't mutually exclusive. exclusive. Companies often operate in more than one, and this all depends on their strategic approach to CSR. But you know, as you kind of evolve through the theaters, there's kind of different levels of engagement and input required. So it's what's comfortable and what makes sense for your business. Your CSR should feel like a natural part of what your company stands for. For example, while a local cafe might focus on something like reducing waste and kind of the reuse um, and recycling, a big fashion brand could work on improving the lives of workers in overseas factories um, as well. And that's something we've seen become very common as well. So it's also about scale and what works for your business and what works for your kind of consumer group too. Your CSR strategy should also reflect what your stakeholders care about. This establishes both internal buy-in and ensures your kind of external stakeholder value is maintained. What environmental and societal issues matter most to your employees, your investors and your customers? And this is really important kind of for public entities as well. Um, what is their current perception of your brand uh, from an environmental and a social perspective as well? Are you seen as a company that does good for the planet? Are you seen as a diverse and inclusive employer um, as well? Or are you kind of lagging in those areas? This can be achieved through, you know, this kind of gathering this perspective is achieved through things like surveys, town hall meetings, focus groups, consultations, and customer polls, among other things. It can also be as simple as sending out a form to your employees to get, you know, to, for them to rate their current perspective, you know, what the internal operations are like, or what they think the CS, how the CSR programs are currently functioning as well. And, you know, it's a good way to kind of create a benchmark within the organization. Stakeholders are all the physical and legal entities that you interact with um, in a company. So they range from, you know, internal employees, you know, to customers, business partners, public authorities, suppliers um, as well. And the CSR kind of remit expands that even further to so things like NGOs and governments um, as well. Different stakeholders have different relationships with the company. So you have to think about your active, you know, economic stakeholders, your suppliers, your business partners, your customers and your employees then you know you kind of move that away a degree your observers and the influencers so the nonprofits the trade unions the lobbyists as well and then the beneficiaries are you know in some cases actually the victims as well um who have the direct or indirect effects of your company's activities too so that's going even further down the chain and another step of removal the first phase of a csr strategy is to identify the company's internal and external stakeholders so take a moment often to Brainstorm, list the different stakeholders who interact with your company. You can go a step further and um, kind of rank your stakeholders in, in order to understand the influence each has on the business as well. And then your CSR strategy should include a clear plan for how it will be communicated internally and externally to foster enthusiasm, engagement and accountability 
as well. It should be a clear and transparent kind of method using the appropriate channels to keep all of these stakeholders on the same page as well. Once our stakeholders have been identified, it's useful to understand the impact um, as well and their expectations of how the company um, will then go forth managing its social impact as well. The aim of that, the kind of material, the materiality assessment um, is to rank the company's social, environmental and economic commitments. By comparing the expectations of your stakeholders with those of the company, you can establish the guidelines for your CSR strategy. Conducting a materiality analysis is generally voluntary, but it is strongly recommended um, in diff you know, depending on the context to achieve really kind of robust um, results as well, especially if you kind of are able to garner a lot of input to it as well. So for example, you know, there's well-known formats uh, for CSR reporting, such as the GRI, which is your global reporting initiative, or the UN Global Compact is another really common one where we see the mix between SDGs and business. As such, is suitable for companies of all sizes and industries dealing with sustainability issues as well. So yeah, as I said, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the cafe or if you're the large kind of fashion retailer as well. Material, a material, a materiality assessment um, still has kind of relevance to your organization. And the goal of this assessment is to determine which issues are most relevant and impactful, guiding the development of your CSR strategy and initiatives as well. So in terms of some of the key components, which are listed here on the left um, as well, we start with the identification of issues. So this is gathering input from internal and external stakeholders to identify a comprehensive list of potential issues relevant to the organization. Stakeholders may include, you know, as I kind of said, your employees, your customers, your investors, your NGOs as well. And sometimes it's tailoring those kind of channels and forms to those different audiences to make sure that the input is correct as well. And this forms part of your stakeholder engagement. So this helps them kind of gain the insights into the issues that are considered most material as well. So, you know, you have to look at what the difference between an investor um, of an investor issue is going to be compared to, say, an NGO issue. There's obviously going to be the people and versus the profit um, as well. The third is then an internal assessment. So assessing the uh, internal impact of each of the identified issues on the organization's operations, the reputation, the financial performance, and the strategic goals, considering the potential risks and opportunities associated with each marker. And then an external benchmark compares those identified issues with the industry standards um, and the global frameworks as well. So this includes things like the SDGs, how do we align to the SDGs? Um, what have been other organizations in the market been doing in this as well? Where are we seeing market averages? And all that data is you know, highly available um, as well to kind of go out and use. This helps in understanding how the organization's priorities align with broader social expectations as well. We then take all that information and produce it into a nice materiality matrix, which um, we've demonstrated on the right-hand side as well. So this visually represents the significance of each issue based on two key dimensions, the impact of the organization and the impact to the stakeholders as well. Issues falling in your high impact, high importance quadrant are considered the most material and should be the focus of your strategy. We then have the validation and refinement as well. So you often never get it right on the first go as well. So validating the, material, the materiality matrix with stakeholders will ensure that their perspectives are accurately, accurately represented as well. And then you can con continue to refine that assessment based on the feedback from them. Often whenever you see it mapped out um, in person, it kind of can create a different way of thinking um, about some of these issues as well and the prioritization you might have given them. And then integrating it into the strategy, of course, um, is the final step. So taking your prioritized issues and then looking towards the organization's business strategy and your CSR initiatives and thinking, how are we going to achieve these as well? And begin setting that roadmap and those goals um, as well and align that to the mission and the value of the organization. So then, yes, going on to the next kind of stage, it's then setting measurable goals. So, you know, it's great to do all the work, but how do you actually measure that and make sure it's a success um, as well? So CSR is mostly people and environmental focused, and both are highly dynamic fields, especially in the current climate as well. We're continually seeing new social dynamics, new environmental challenges as well. So the strategy should evolve and be informed by data and feedback collected from all the different current, you know, CSR activities um, that you carry out. These data points then should then be turned into kind of OKRs. OKR stands for objective and key results, and it's a goal setting framework that helps organizations define and track objectives and their outcomes. 
OKRs are widely used in the business world to align teams, set ambitious goals, um, and measure progress in a transparent and measurable way. And it typically consists of two components. So the first is the objectives. These are the high level qualitative goals that articulate what an organization or a team aims to achieve. They're meant to be inspiring, motivating, and aligned with the organization's mission and strategy and kind of answer the question of what do we want to accomplish as well. So on the right hand side, I've actually got some of the examples of CSRNs um, as well. So in terms of acquisitions, we really wanted to look at, you know, the number of new organizations contacted for each round as well and kind of build that figure. If we're able to achieve that outreach, then yeah, we know we've done a good job. We know we've done the effort on our part to get responses, you know, and then we look at our conversion rate um, from those as well and drip down from that too. So these are, yeah, that's just an example of kind of where we've um, we've set those OKRs that's very much aligned to the mission of acquisitions is the number of organizations you outreach to um, as well. And then your key results, which um, again, follows the SMART framework quite frequently. So they should be specific, measurable and quantifiable, um, indicating the progress towards the achieved objective um, as well. Another very good way to do your OKRs is firstly setting your target state as well. So what do we want to aim? What is going to achieve success? They shouldn't always be 100%, kind of depending on what obviously the target is. So this gives you some bandwidth to go above and kind of see metrics that you might be hitting above and beyond your current target. And that's for you to kind of re-baseline the organization and your expectations. If you're continuously going above and beyond, then as an organization, you maybe need to target higher rates as well and kind of you know scale. And then there's the below target as well. So where is the bandwidth that if we fall below, we start we have to flag this as an issue as well. There is acceptable kind of targets below uh, that fall just short of the target kind of um, goal. But whenever you say, yeah, go below a certain amount, when does it need to escalate? When do we need to actually address an issue quite immediately too? So yes, um, as I mentioned, you know, the SMART approach um, is one that I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. And these kind of SMART goals help you communicate your CSR vision and strategy to your internal and external stakeholders and demonstrate your accountability and transparency. By setting SMART goals, you can align your CSR objectives uh, with your core business uh, values and mission and ensure that they're consistent with the expectations and needs of your customers, employees, partners and society as well. To set these goals, it's very essential to follow a systematic process that involves identifying key CSR issues and opportunities, conducting a gap analysis to assess the current performance and the impact, and prioritizing the most important and urgent issues through your materiality as well. To effectively monitor your SMART goals, you then need to establish the system of tracking, measuring, and reporting your performance and impact of your CSR issues and opportunities as well. And that's often going beyond the financial measures and means, looking into things like double materiality um, as well, but we'll kind of come on to the sustainable reporting later. So this includes defining your relevant KPIs and metrics, thinking about the way you're collecting and analyzing your data as well, and the reliable sources. And this is a particular challenge, especially in the kind of the ESG space is reliable sources and benchmarks. And then comparing these actual results with your expected results, so looking at your target OKRs and kind of seeing where did you land as well. Reporting this upward uh, to stakeholders in a very clear and transparent manner. So where there are shortcomings, it's not trying to cover up as well. It's setting a clear plan of action of how you're going to remediate um, as well. Or if you're above, how you're going to then start to scale your organization to meet this new, this new demand as well. And those, you will always kind of continue to refine and revise these goals. You might set new ones, you might get rid of some, you might up the targets, you might reduce the targets as well. So they're very dynamic um, to have. So that's kind of, that would be kind of some of the key steps um, in going about forming the strategy um, as well, making sure, you know, it's well guided, it's well planned out, and it's very measurable as well. And you can kind of communicate success from that strategy. So those are just some of the steps um, in taking it. We then move on to how you kind of engage and involve your employees. So obviously within the corporate sphere um, as well, there's many, many different stake, internal stakeholders, internal employees at play. So how do we start to get them involved in CSR initiatives as well and out of just the day to day? So there's a number of ways uh, for employees to get involved in CSR, each with kind of an increasing amount of time, commitment, resource and support, and also accountability for delivery and even sometimes expertise required within the area. 
The first is volunteer roles, which are the most common as well. When I was at PwC, I was very involved in kind of volunteering efforts as well. We did things like sleepouts for homeless, you know, fundraising um, events and all those kind of ones. And that was my first experience within CSR as well. And it was very, very fundamental, um, I suppose, at that time. And it was very interesting to see how CSR grew out in such a big organization too. So, yeah, volunteer kind of roles are most commonly employees we get two to three days per year um, to volunteer with either, you know, partner charities of the firm or charities of our choice as well. Although volunteer days can be a great initiative, it's very common for them to go unused. And I could point this out in any company that I've been in as well, where I know multitudes of people who haven't used um, their volunteer days throughout the year. I think I've always had people joke with me if um, they could give me a few of them to use um, use for the side projects as well. Um, so it's very difficult also to create a tangible and measurable impact um, kind of in such a short amount of time as well. So if you think about working directly with an organization, there's only so much you can do in one or two days as well for that organization. And it has to be something that can be handed over or has a very quick end to it as well. So that there's not a reliance on you beyond those two days. Um, so, in, yeah, over time, you know, this has become a very common approach. And therefore, we've seen individuals get more creative in making effective use of their time, such as breaking it down into, say, hour long slots to deliver like long term mentorship programs to students. And that's something we've implemented in CSR, uh, CSRN. So on projects, we match students with professional mentors who every week will take an hour over an eight week period. Um, and then they will mentor the students on this on the kind of the consulting project as well. And that means that firstly, the mentor only uses one day of the volunteering time but it's effectively stretched out in our long advisory increments as well, and then continues to support a team to, for more for a larger body of work um, as well. Also using it to attend nonprofit events and summits. I used some of my volunteer days last year uh, to attend the One Young World Summit as well. And I know other people that have done that for say different industry events on during the days um, as well and nonprofit events too. Providing subject matter expertise uh, to different working groups or taking on advisory board positions, especially for those who are more senior wanting to use their time and their specialisms. So, um, you know, you've developed such a subject matter expertise and such an experienced leader. Using your volunteer days could actually be more effective from the advisory sense um, as well. So board positions, especially in smaller nonprofits, are something that is often very de desirable and not too time intensive um, as well. The role of the corporate volunteer is one that's unlikely to change, um, with firms considering it a very easy and a flexible CSR option with minimal business impact. However, they should consider um, encouraging collective volunteering days to scale the impact or rewarding the effective use of volunteering, volunteering opportunities with more dedicated time. So getting employees to report back in on what they're actually doing uh, with their volunteer days and kind of rewarding that, um, th that effort. And also it gives the firm then something to report on. Two. Side of desk is one that I'm sure many are also familiar with as well. And I'm sure at some point throughout our career, we've had some form of a side of desk um, project. So these are projects and work that we do alongside our day to day plant work and the business as usual activities. Often these side of desk projects are in areas of high interest to ourselves and present an opportunity to build an understanding or build our experience in a certain capability. So some of these activities can look like proposal development, creating thought leadership in blog posts, running internal working groups and learning sessions, or else running and engaging in different networking events as well. And this is especially within the corporate space too. And taking those activities and pushing into the bounds of sustainability and decarbonization and diversity and inclusion, often many firms will be more than happy for their employees to set up say, a sustainability working group or a diversity and inclusion working group and how do you then engage and collaborate with, say, internal recruitment or your kind of your partners as well and kind of turn those projects into something more tangible? And then as CSR has evolved into a strategic priority, this has led to the emergence of more full time CSR roles within the organization. Recognizing the, the increasing significance of social and environmental responsibility, companies are now committing to these sustainable practices and ethical business conducts as well. And as the societal expectations for corporate accountability have grown, so too is the demand for specialised professionals to navigate what is now this very complex um, landscape of CSR. These dedicated CSR professionals play a pivotal role in formulating and implementing these strategies um, that the, the company wants to create. 
and then aligning these to the business objectives and the positive social and environmental impact and reporting that back to your senior stakeholders. So this shift towards dedicated CSR roles underscores the part the paradigm shift in corporate mindset, acknowledging that responsible business practices are not just a moral imperative, but they're also integral to the long-term success and stakeholder trust. In terms of supporting engagement, there's a number of approaches, and this generally comes from leadership as well and kind of setting it as part of the firm's operating model and ways of working. So the first always comes from the top, and that's being a role model. A key driver of employee engagement and participation is transparency within senior management. So I think there was a study carried out by USA Today that said once employees see their leaders volunteer, donate and participate in social activities, they will have a higher tendency to follow them as well. So that's always the kind of the infamous saying of change comes from the top. The second then is letting employees lead um, as well. So there was a study um, back in 2016, which kind of showed that 75% of employees qualified their work as more satisfying when they were allowed to make a positive impact. This brings us to the kind of crucial point um, of CSR. CSR benefits stretch further than helping your business reach just its ESG targets. They actually boost productivity because people feel more motivated and loyal to the company. And again, this is this change to more purpose-driven work as well that we've seen uh, become so popular as well. And that means it's very important to engage and talk to your employees, asking them what kind of activities interest them, not just dictating the actions that they should um, they should be doing. Rewarding this um, as well. So I'd say over half of employees believe that one way to boost employee engagement is to reward it. So, you know, if you mean business when it comes to achieving objectives related to CSR, consider things like a reward scheme, you know, ideally one that supports the good causes you're directing your efforts at as well. So supporting your engagement into a new sustainable product or service as well, supporting your efforts to market um, market this kind of this new direction for the firm, supporting any, you know, increases in diversity and inclusion that you can create, say, through referral schemes as well. So, yeah, an example of that is incentivizing your employees to actually reduce their own carbon footprints as well. So we've seen the increase of, say, working from home as well. So encouraging employees to work from home maybe two, three, three days a week and reduce the amount of commute um, that they need to do as well. And then, you know, reducing their travel emissions um, is a very easy and effective way to do that. And then finally, there's recognizing impact as well. So recognition is also a biggie when it comes to engaging your people. All too often, employees only receive feedback when they've done something wrong, and I've been there before as well. Um, this only serves to diminish confidence and put up a wall kind of between um, the, you know, your employee and the employer as well. So instead, think about injecting policies into your CSR activities that celebrate people when they get it right. Even a brief call out on a team meeting will go a long way to keep people engaged. So ways I've seen that now being done is, you know, in Elixir, we have a monthly business-wide meeting and that ends each time with um, recognitions and shout outs as well, where people will just stand to the front and recognize, you know, other people that they've worked with who have gone above and beyond as well. Um, in PwC, we had actually internal kind of currency um, called GEMS as well. And these did actually translate to a financial reward, but you could recognize other people. Um, I think we did GEMS on a... It was either a monthly basis um, as well. You would give someone your gems, which was equivalent to, I think, five pounds as well and write a recognition with it. And that was often, again, where people went above and beyond. So those were two two very good ways um, in which we saw this delivered. So the next is then community engagement um, as well. And this is kind of going outside of the business um, too and thinking more, um, yeah, more broadly than just your internal stakeholders. So yeah firstly we want to look at solution driven collaboration um as well so again if you're in the early stages of forming your csr strategies um as well in your initiatives collaborating and engaging with local communities and stakeholders is then crucial for the success of these programs firstly it just helps build trust with you as an organization and the communities that you operate in it also enhances your reputation becoming more approachable um as well and therefore fostering a kind of a very positive relationship as well i think People still very much underestimate the power of word of mouth as well, especially whenever you're operating in smaller communities or more rural communities as well. So engaging well with the people um, is kind of a surefire way to kind of build that positive relationship and set you in good standing from the start. We've already noted some of the external stakeholders in kind of some of the previous slides. They're also crucial to kind of, they're, they're the crucial ones to involve in this engagement as well. So achieve the success 
um, in kind of solution driven collaboration an organization th should think about firstly respecting local customs and cultures and this is particularly difficult whenever you're working at a global level in the organization you need to invest um, in programs which work towards um, local ad adaption as well and understand different cultures from working cultures as well and adopting different kind of policies to that so I know say the American way of working is very different from the European way of working as well in terms of things like time boundaries and the you know contacting people in and outside of work as well and even when it comes down to like lunch breaks as well it's a very very different way of working and you have to respect kind of the home territory as well on these things and also local customs as well so that you're not infringing and causing offense too so um yeah whenever you're designing your kind of and implementing these csr programs it's very important to think about those kind of traditions avoid imposing solutions that may have worked elsewhere but could be considered culturally offensive as well in the new context so it's not as much about you know lift and reuse local kind of customs need really kind of specific understanding um as well and this is again where local engagement comes in as well you only kind of actually get that understanding from engaging with local communities employing local people um as well and that has to become part of your wider strategy prioritizing long-term partnerships is next so kind of building long-term relationships with local communities and stakeholders is key it avoid you know avoiding more of the one-off initiatives um as well and focusing on the sustainable pro programs has more of a lasting impact as well it makes you more of a trusted supplier for generations and that's only going to you know broaden and broaden your customer and your consumer base as time goes on continual engagement and collaboration fosters trust and demonstrates the commitment to the community's well-being as well so it's not about arriving in a new community, doing one one workshop to say, okay, here's who we are, what do you guys want from us, and then never speaking again. It's good to kind of, you know, check in and engage with your communities, with your customers um, as well, and with your employees on a more regular basis. And then if there's certain events or, you know, natural disasters, anything like that that might occur as well in the community, it means that you're there to kind of, you're there as a support as well. You can gain a quicker understanding than your competitors in how to respond um, effectively to those different events. The third is then assessing the community needs and aspirations. So conducting thorough assessments of the community, uh, the priorities and the aspirations, engaging with their local leaders, with the community members and the different organisations already op operating there to gain insights and understanding to what the most pressing issues are and then taking those issues and feeding that into again your materiality to align your CSR initiatives with those needs. And then investing kind of in supporting the development of local communities by offering training, skill building programs, capacity building initiatives, helping community members gain the knowledge and the skills necessary for their economic and social advancement. Looking at some of these back by looking at some of these best practices, you can build strong relationships with local communities and stakeholders and ensure that your CSR programs are effective, sustainable and aligned with local needs and priorities. From the business sense, then we kind of have to look at it more um, from a customer value perspective. So stakeholders must perceive value in a certain CSR activity to actually support the firm's engagement in it. This is particularly true for the customer as well, who's a key stakeholder in any kind of business enterprise. An effective model to examine the potential customer value creation of CSR activities defines value as an interactive relativistic preference experience. So value isn't interactive because it can be created only when a firm and its customer come together. Value is based on preference because each customer responds to a product, a service or a corporate initiative based on his or her personal subjective taste. Finally, value is relativistic because each customer's perception is influenced by external factors relative to the environment in which the customer lives. Again, and that's that local understanding. So sensitivity to certain social issues depending on say the levels of education, the intellectual or the experiential exposure a customer has had as well. So the model that we have on the slide shows the application of CSR activities in the form of or, you know, organic agricultural practices as well. And this is something we see more common in rural regions too. So each of the four quadrants outlined in the model represent potential types of customer value resulting from a certain CSR activity as well. So we have the self-orientated uh, intrinsic value. Uh, so this is quadrant one. Um, and this is around the efficiency, the efficiency or excellence of the product or service offered by the business as well. 
So a higher quality product is going to outcompete in the market and um, compared to lower standards um, as well and becomes a customer preference. And in the case of agriculture, often has a lot of health benefits too. The quadrant two is then other orientated intrinsic value. So the personal joy or aesthetic appreciation resulting from consuming the product or using the service as well. So organic is probably the best example for that in agriculture, the kind of the aesthetic of buying only organic food as well. And how we've seen that marketed across the world is actually an incredible CSR um, initiative that's gone very well. And yeah, you know, you consider you automatically consider new more value with an organic product. Quadrant three is then self-orientated extrinsic value. So the status or esteem associated with consuming the product and using the service. So yeah, as I said, as I talked about organic, you're immediately, it's something we tie to a higher socioeconomic bracket. You know, it's a higher cost. It's better for you. It's healthier um, as well. And therefore your status is elevated through the consumption of that product. And, you know, I mean, in some cases, organic is obviously a difficult one because organic is often better for you. But when we look at other different goods and services, sometimes there can be no difference. It's actually just kind of in the marketing um, as well. And that's where you have to watch that your product actually does have these benefits and what you're selling to them is real um, as well. And it's not just a kind of almost a greenwashing exercise. And then other orientated extrinsic values, so the ethical or the spiritual benefit of the product consumption or service use as well. So if the consumer is going to buy organic, that is more likely to contribute to more positive environmental standards as well so you know throughout the agricultural process there has been less emissions as well there's probably been less transport involved um as well and that extra price that you pay has has an additional you know benefit to it as well the model shows how certain consumption behavior can contribute to multiple or even all types of value and that the coexistence of these values um types in a certain csr activity is the norm rather than the expectation Business leaders should be mindful of all the four types whenever they kind of create and present a CSR um, activity um, to. So thinking about your kind of your customer targeting to you. And this is then engaging your customer, creating additional value for the business through CSR activities as well. And that's how we sell it upwards um, and increase the kind of the scale that they can run at as well. In terms of how CSRs um, evolved, it's yeah, it's been a very interesting journey, and it's interesting to see where a lot of companies now sit along their CSR journey. To some have kind of taken it and ran as well, others have lagged behind as well. So I suppose in this, I want to focus on maybe some of the companies that have managed to do it better and kind of what does it actually look like in reality. So we will start off. Oh, slip on my hands. Um, so. In the course of pursuing CSR initiatives, recent trends suggest that more and more companies are adopting CSR approaches to help ensure the efficiency, stimulate innovation, and create continued organizational growth. Some companies have even developed very innovative products and services that are beneficial to the company's profitability. By incorporating both intended and potentially unexpected and unintended outcomes into a company's strategic business plan, the CSR process can serve as a framework in which such innovations can be identified and then exploit it to the company's advantage. They take extra care to make preservation of the environment a priority. They reach out to their local communities in a way that goes beyond their product lines and beyond just mere compliance. Corporate leaders must remain vigilant to recognize opportunities to use innovation to their advantage in terms of its impact on their bottom line. Although the phrase thinking outside the box has become somewhat worn, it is entirely appropriate in this case because the innovation in question may well be the unexpected or unintended beneficial outcomes of something that is already being done within the organization as well. So this is where your materiality assessment comes in of what are some of the things that you're actually maybe already doing that you aren't measuring um, to. And then introducing some of the new, new methods, concepts and devices as well to your organization. In order to answer when opportunity knocks, then requires a corporate culture that makes this identification of innovation opportunities a priority. Truly inspired innovations may be rare, but even modest gains taken together over time will help a company's bottom line. Of course, in some cases, there will be such an, innov there will be such an innovative concept, method or device that has potentially widespread consumer appeal um, that results from a company's CSR efforts as well. And we'll look at a couple of examples on the next slide. Assuming then that a company has achieved such an aha moment in this quest and has identified an innovative approach through the use of CSR initiatives, there are some important considerations involved that should be taken into account 
as well. So this is things like the long-term impact um, as well, the idea that you come up with, it's not just thinking about immediate returns, it's how, you know, is this gonna impact and affect communities in the long run as well. So if you go ahead and introduce this product to the market, but you are faced by say economic headwinds, long-term cost impacts and other kind of challenges in the business, you're not just going to pull that product back um, from the market as well um, because of those competing corporate goals or you know competing profit uh, profit targets. Because by pulling back often something that is you know a CSR or a social initiative, you actually hurt the beneficiaries more um, than just kind of by doing nothing at all because you've accustomed this new this new service or this product that has increased the value in their lives. So then by taking that away, you set them almost back. You set them you know back down further than they were as well. There are a number of ethoses to apply to CSR activities, which can be achieved through innovation um, in a business. So stay ahead of the curve with rules and regulation as well, and use CSR as an opportunity to do that. Keep your programs and your practices and your products clean through continual review. In times of trouble, don't wait for the community needs to become community nuisances as well. So don't just brush aside minor, minor kind of community complaints as well, address them. And then make environmental groups your friends, not your foes um, as well. As we've seen, many environmental groups are becoming more and more um, out there uh, in some of their approaches as well and how they're kind of engaging with different corporate organizations. The obvious example being one like Just Stop Oil, which just took multiple headlines as well. So you need to think about engaging with these groups as well and um, bringing them into some of the narrative and the conversations. How can they inform the roadmap and again, make you look collaborative um, two. So two examples that I really want to kind of highlight around social impact innovation um, is Google and Microsoft as well. So the first is Google's Project Loon. So we all know Google, a global leader in technology and innovation, and one of probably uh, their most ambitious projects has been Project Loon. The project aims to provide internet access to remote and rural areas of the world using high altitude balloons that float in the stratosphere. The balloons act as floating cell towers that can connect to ground stations and deliver wireless signals to user devices. The project has been tested and deployed in various countries such as New Zealand, Brazil, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Kenya as well, and has a potential to improve education, health, communication and economic opportunities for millions of people who lack reliable internet access. So firstly, not only does this obviously improve, as I said, their lives, but it also improves Google's consumer base. By bringing connection to those areas, they get access to internet. And when we all use internet, what is one of the first search kind of functions that we find? Google as well. So immediately Google has increased their customer base through CSR activities. So they're seeing a return kind of in value to the business, but also creating such a difference um, on the ground for these kind of communities as well. And this is where there's an element of self-serving as well. And you can see where the sign off and the idea would have came from um, on Google's side too. The second is then Microsoft and their kind of data for disability initiatives as well. So surprisingly, there's actually very little reliable data about people with disabilities and what it, um, and what does exist in is kind of incredibly fragmented as well. Microsoft spotted this challenge. This means that there's a need um, for kind of lot of, for you know a need for data um, for policymakers as well. And in 2022, Microsoft partnered with the World Bank and the Disability Data Initiative at Fordham University to gather and present more accurate data about the disability community worldwide. The public facing online disability data hub provides information on disability prevalence, representation and inclusion globally. Governments, nonprofits, journalists, employers, all use that hub to better understand the barriers for individuals with disabilities based on different factors such as age, gender and socioeconomic background. So yeah, this you know the work's been underway for a year, uh, a year now, and they've released some of the initial findings throughout 2023 and continue to grow and scale that as well. Um, and in, in addition, in addition to this kind of initiative, Microsoft also joined several other tech giants in 2022 to partner with the University of Illinois to create the speech the speech accessibility project. So they took that data and leveraged it into something very impactful. The research initiative is gathering data for you know people with atyp atypical speech patterns. Uh, which will then be used to make voice recognition technology more useful for people uh, with diverse speech patterns and disabilities as well. And again, you think about this from the Microsoft side, there's so many different Microsoft, you know, equipment, resources, laptops, um, 
different systems that we use that have kind of speech uh, speech patterns and speech recognition um, as part of them, phones being a prime case as well. So this is investing also in their product development side as well um, and how it's more accessible for consumers, making them kind of a choice buyer over, say, someone like Apple um, as well. So again, highlighting a business benefit through the innovation. The next one then is environmental stewardship as well. So we've all seen you know, everything around sustainability, around ESG as well, but this does form part of CSR as well. And this is where we start to see a lot of the terms kind of blend to environmental responsibility is a pillar of corp corporate social responsibility rooted in preserving mother nature. So through optimal operations and support of related causes, a company can ensure that it leaves natural resources better than before its operations. These companies can pursue environmental stewardship through, say, reducing pollution, waste, natural resource consumption and emissions, especially in their manufacturing process. This is achieved through more focus on resource efficiency, conservation programs in collaboration with their suppliers, transition to natural products and adopting lean manufacturing principles. There's also recycling goods and materials throughout its process, including promoting reuse practices among customer groups. This covers, you know, everything from like paper, plastic, glass, metal, all very common, um, across to then recycling and um, to tackle material supply challenges um, as well. So I think midway through last year, I worked for a large manufacturing organization. They were looking at the recycling product uh, of their product, how they could acquire a business into their kind of operations that would be able to um, recycle, get the, you know, the primary material back out and put that back into the manufacturing process as well. Um, and that was kind of in the lithium space and the chemical space as well. And then, yeah, education and awareness courses on kind of reuse principles are also really key to extending on your product life cycle um, as well, which, you know, is widely demonstrated to have kind of good returns on business. We then have offsetting negative impacts by replenishing natural resources or supporting causes that can help neutralize the company's impact. For example, a manufacturer that deforests um, trees may commit to planting the same amount uh, more and more. But yeah, um, as well, we've seen great initiatives of that, I think, where you can buy a product and plant a tree. As well, it's turned, it's not just, you know, a donation now or an internal donation um, to people have tied it, companies have tied it directly to the product and the sales. And this, you know, effectively is increased sales volume too. Conscious distribution is then choosing methods that have the least impact on emission and pollution. So this includes transitioning to more local suppliers to reduce shipment emissions, keeping stricter compliance on your suppliers as well for their operating procedures. And then finally, creating product uh, lines that enhance these values. So the prime example of this is the vehicle industry and the whole transition from gas to electricity. Um, and this is all with the effort of reducing global carbon emissions as well. So at one point, electric vehicles was purely an idea. And now, look, you know, Tesla is one of the highest performing companies, most globally traded stocks as well. So these enhancements of product lines are one of the leading ways to increase revenue and sales while also pursuing your CSR ambitions. Now, I couldn't mention CSR without Patagonia, um, especially environmental CSR, probably one of the best um, leading organizations. So their Action Works has given nearly 90 million in support of activism and advocacy as well. They also, all their manufacturing processes are highly lean and minimize environmental impacts. And any environmental impact is then offset um, as well. They've also got the 1% for the planet. Uh, so this is, you know, this was created back, I think, in 2002. And it involves donating 1% of the company's annual sales to environmental organizations around the world as well. And to think an organization of that scale, 1% is a lot. Um, as well, and it's I think the program supported over six thousand groups, with you know over two hundred million pounds in grants um, now donated. The other then is IKEA as well, so the world kind of the world renowned um, furniture manufacturer as well. They have taken a very interesting kind of three prong approach to their CSR um, as well. So some of the actions, the strategies include is offering affordable and energy efficient products. They've done more investment into renewable energy and circular business models, circular business being kind of one of the key ones. They've reduced their waste and emissions and supported social and environmental initiatives as well. And this overall has then helped IKEA reduce its environmental footprint, increase its profitability as well, and strengthen its brand image and customer loyalty. 
We then have the education and skills gap um, as well, which I'm also aware of time, so I'm not, I'll kind of not go over too much as well. But there's many different approaches um, to, to this and, you know, the education, the role it plays as well. So sponsorship and scholarship as well is um, funding students to go into higher education or even just kind of, you know, or more students to go into primary education initiatives. Online skills programs. Now, this is, you know, with the advancements in digital learning, creating, you know, internal learning programs and then publishing them externally to help, you know, def you know, anyone that has access upskill in, in, you know, certain kind of techniques um, and skill sets. And this is especially applicable to now the digital skill set and the changing workforce as well. So using like online education to upskill and something like AI is highly valuable um, for employers. Institutional collaboration, another area that I was involved with during my time in PwC, so working with universities to co-collaborate and build courses um, that, you know, lead students directly to employment as well. And it's a great way of bridging that education employment gap. Tech and infrastructure support um, as well. So something I also worked in then um, last summer uh, in South Africa as well. So it was a bank that was helping kind of build out a technology and art um, and a sports center. Um, within South Africa, you know, schools in kind of very poor regions as well. And that was to give students a more holistic curriculum as well and kind of improve their, their, you know, engagement in education. And that was then with the, with the long term vision of improving the workforce in South Africa. Internships and, apprentice, and apprenticeships, of course, are very accessible. There's less barriers to entry within those. It's a more broad range of skills as well. It's not just academic uh, workforces. It can be a lot of manual labor skills as well. And then again, obviously, community engagement. So, you know, showing the, the community how the workforce is adapting, how they can reskill, you know, bringing educators into that journey and working with governments to kind of help that transition. So two yeah, very good kind of examples of that. There's Cornbread, uh, Cornbread Hustle, which is a rehabilitation program. So working with um, previous criminals um, who have, you know, you know mostly minor offences, to kind of reskill them as well, build the entrepreneurship as well, get them back into kind of employment and stability to reduce reoffending rates. And then also the Washington Post, and this is more of actually a very uncommon one of the Washington Post is taken to short form media, so through the likes of TikTok, um, to actually address the rise in fake and misleading information which is circulating on the internet as well. So achieving more of a, a positive good with that. So the next one I want to jump onto is then CSR, uh, CSR and the supply chain as well. And, and, you know, the supply chain is an integral part of most businesses and is essential to the company's success and customer satisfaction. So it plays an important, it's important to consider whether all your suppliers, all your workers and other companies are implementing CSR activities and practices. So the first, uh, you know, there's four strands um, and applications of CSR in the supply chain. So the first is environmental responsibility as well. And this is the commitment and actions taken by your companies and suppliers to minimize, um, obviously, the emissions from their operations as well, especially when they're involved in things like sourcing raw materials, manufacturing processes, transportation as well. So choosing, actively choosing suppliers who have a lower kind of emission rate as well and have more sustainable strategies um, and transition strategies in place too. We then have the philanthropic as well. So, um, you know, this is more reflective of internal ones. It's, you know, so showing support for global and local initiatives, addressing critical social issues as well. So things like racism, education, equity and healthcare as well. Um, and strengthening that bond with the community. So seeing this in your suppliers as well is a very indication that they have a lot of established local trust or else that they're operating well on the global platform. We then have ethics. So this is very much around uh, fair labor practices. Um, so companies should be treating everyone with dignity and respect, offering equal employment opportunities. Obviously, we've seen this through things like modern slavery acts as well, reducing modern slavery um, and kind of labor dis dissatisfaction and um, things like the gender gap as well and gender bias, how they tackle those, uh, those kind of ethical labor issues as well and create, you know, inclusive um, and supportive workplaces. And then economic as well. So making financial, you know, decisions that contribute to the environmental uh, environment and society as well. And this is making financial decisions that reduce, reduce the long term risk of the organization. Oftentimes when you are going through procurement and supply, you're looking at years and years of a contract as well. You don't want to get into a 10 year contract and four years in realize that the company has no sustainable future because they didn't make the right investments early as well. 
In terms of how that responsibility is achieved, um, as well, there's kind of three approaches um, that your organization can take to then the supply chain. The first is, you know, more regular updates to your supplier code of contact um, as well. Um, so I would say that is starting to look at, you know, ethical labor practices, you know, employee protection, environmental protection as well. Um, and this means that by having that updated, both um, the supplier and the employees um, kind of gain the assurance and that they're all operating to the same standards as well. The implementation of that then comes through audits and assessments. So they should occur on a more regular basis across all your organizations in the supply chain. Um, and it can include on-site visits, document reviews, interviews and surveys with employees, and then taking those data points and analyzing them in depth to make sure compliance um, is there, or if necessary, corrective action plans. And a really good point to note on this is if a supplier has a shortcoming in the CSR space, you shouldn't immediately kick them out unless it's obviously very severe. You should work collaboratively to kind of improve and set those correct corrective action plans and show that you can work collaboratively with the market, make you more appealing for other bidders as well to work with. Um, because oftentimes these kind of these engagements travel by word of mouth um, as well. And just it brings a lot of mutual success. The third is then setting new procurement standards from the outset. So bringing ESG evaluation and criteria into your bids as well, bringing the ESG team into say your collaborative solutioning um, with bidders as well, assigning a percentage of the evaluation to ESG um, and CSR um, as well, and having that as part of your decision-making tree. And then finally, CSR and corporate investment, and I'll be quick through this. Um, as well uh, with three minutes left so yes um this is essentially how employ you know the financial value of um csr so csr can improve capital uh, access to capital in several ways a social responsible and sustainable business practices have become increasingly important considerations for investors so things like attracting responsible investors um as well we've seen the increase in socially responsible investment funds Impact investors is becoming an increasingly common term as well. They all prioritize companies with strong CSR practices. Also enhanced reputation and trust, um, again, within the community and within your investors. Longer term risk mitigation as well. So, you you know, you've actively worked towards the climate, uh, climate change and how to mitigate that impact on your business and your operations. More access to responsible investment funds um, as well. So making your, you know, this will mean your business is eligible for inclusion um, in those kind of funds and indices as well. And being part of that creates, creates increased visibility among investors in that network too. Again, similar to the risk, it's about long-term value creation as well. So longer term returns, access to green financing, especially related to environmental sustainable practices, and then market differentiation as well. So CSR initiatives differentiate the company in the market, making it stand out among competitors who aren't who maybe aren't as advanced, and then this makes you more, you know, attractive to investors as well. And then, of course, regulatory compliance um, as well kind of underpins all of this as well. A company that can operate well within regulation is one that's going to attract higher investment. In terms of social investment, this is almost the flip side of CSR. So where CSR focuses on accountability, CSI is about making a financial commitment to a worthwhile project, charity or endeavour and centers around a number of causes from community development to caring for the environment. And the aim is to make a financial commitment to positive change, but one that will deliver a positive return on investment. And this is what differentiates CSR from typical charitable donations um, as well. So yes, um, while we're coming probably towards the end, um, end of time on that one. So um, I suppose you can quickly see here, there's three stages to it in terms of the prepare, the refine and the build. Um, as well and kind of the approach you should take on that. Sustainable reporting is the other one and this is particularly important with the implementation of you know numerous new frameworks and methodologies as well to adhere to and these are becoming mandatory rather than voluntary um, as well so taking a very formulaic and planned out approach to your reporting to ensure it's as comprehensive as possible. So that brings me to the end of the presentation and apologies to kind of rush towards the end. Uh, but yeah, in summary, the strategic importance of CSR lies in its ability to enhance reputation, build brand loyalty and mitigate risks. By actively engaging in ethical and sustainable practices, companies attract socially conscious consumers, align with regulatory expectations and foster positive stakeholder relationships. 
Moreover, CSRA initiatives contribute to innovation, they boost employee morale, and they enhance overall organizational resilience and competitiveness, making it a strategic necessity for long-term success in today's global business landscape. Thank you very much for listening.